Reporters for Vice News travel the world, putting a human face to the world's most important stories. There's a solid wall of riot police officers. But now, we introduce you to them. They're doing CPR on one of the casualties here. We don't know if he's going to make it. This is Field Notes, a show that sits down with our reporters to find out the stories behind their stories and how they got so close to the action. Feeling pretty good about that? In this episode, we hear from our Breaking the Vote team that reported on democracy on the brink of collapse. From political violence, propaganda, authoritarianism, and more, our reporters covered it all in the weeks leading up to this year's midterms, all while looking ahead to the country's political future. Are you going to certify the election results? If it sits where it stands right now, I won't. It appeared immediately obvious to me that this was a coup attempt. Time's running out, Richard. We're coming after you and every mother that stole this election with our Second Amendment. I think people in the Republican Party have been irresponsible in the way in which they've characterized what happened. And that's something that really pisses me off. Why don't you show us the evidence? I don't have to show you the evidence. I will when time comes. So you must also know that this is exactly what QAnon says as well, right? Thank you guys for joining me today. Breaking the Vote is the way that we at Vice News cover politics, especially the 2022 midterms, not the horse races, not the sort of like numbers, but the themes behind it, especially the anti-democratic themes. So I wanted to start by talking about like, you guys were out in the field, you were hosting from here in New York. What did you see as far as election deniers and the results of these elections and what voters had to say? Start with you, Liz. I would say election deniers didn't do well. Election denialism was rejected at the ballot box. I think uh, there have been a few places that have tallied up how many of these anti-democratic um, election denying candidates lost at the governor's level, at the secretary of state level, at the Senate level, uh, people who had questioned the 2020 election results. Turns out that that's not really a platform that voters uh, really cared about all that much in, in terms of agreeing with election deniers. I think that we were in Arizona for election week and there were three election deniers on the ballot there at Carrie Lake as the governor, Mark Fincham as the secretary of state, and Blake Masters at the Senate level, who'd all questioned the election results. Those people all lost their races. So I would say that overall, it was good for democracy um, that candidates, Republicans and Democrats, who support the democratic process, won in the 2022 midterms. It was definitely good. A lot of them lost. And surprisingly, a lot of them conceded. That was the thing that you didn't expect, right? Because not only losing, but then saying, I didn't really lose, rigged, stolen, Dominion, was a big part of the aftermath of 2020 at a lot of different levels. Not, yes, the presidential level, but all the way down to the local, the hyper-local level places that Liz went in Colorado, New Mexico, and other places like that. So that didn't happen. A lot of high-profile people election deniers running to control elections lost and then conceded, but not all of them did. And that's the thing, this isn't over and we should talk about where these embers are still smoldering and that the kerosene is just off to the side. I really think that it is. So the, like, the most extreme of the election deniers, like the Doug Mastrianos in Pennsylvania, the Mark Fincham in Arizona, these are swing states where, right. like, effectively, if one of these people had won and controlled the way that the elections work in 2024, we might be looking at a totally different landscape as to how a president is elected. But let's talk about the embers, right? Because I think that's ultimately the embers started from someone in 2020 who denied losing the presidential election, right? And, like, brought it as a political concept into the core of the Republican Party. So where, those, where do those embers still exist? And like, what are we looking for going forward? Yeah, I think you've got to talk about Arizona. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, I think for me, the focus will be continuing coverage in the swing states, like in Arizona, like a Pennsylvania, like Michigan, Wisconsin, all places where the election deniers were very prominent in some of those states, did weird stuff with the voting files and, and machines. I'm thinking of Michigan. I think it was Michigan and Michigan Wisconsin. Michigan and Georgia, and access Georgia. and voting machines, leaking data. Right. 
all kinds of stuff that is still also being litigated, investigated. Um, so I think focusing on those places, I think Arizona in particular has become really an epicenter of this. And I think we'll probably continue to cover what is next in a lot of those key places. And all you have to do is look at Kerry Lake in Arizona, running for governor on one of the most just stark anti-democratic platforms that we saw. She had some competition in Pennsylvania and some other places, but Carrie Lake straight up, election was stolen. It's run by clowns, like really, really sharp, kind of awful rhetoric on elections. Carrie Lake lost, we know that. And she is right back on that thing. Remember we talked about all the people who conceded? Not Carrie Lake. She didn't say anything for a few days after she lost. Then she just came out and said, this election was stolen, I didn't really lose, we're amassing lawyers, we're not giving in. And then the next day, where did she go? Right to Mar-a-Lago. Really? Right to appear, yes, right to appear yeah. with Donald Trump. Now, what does that tell you? Huh. I am busy here collecting evidence and data. Rest assured, I have assembled the best and brightest legal team, and we are exploring every avenue to correct the many wrongs that have been done this past week. I'm doing everything in my power to right these wrongs. My resolve to fight for you is higher than ever. Well, Liz, talk to me about political violence, because I think one thing that the Breaking the Vote series covered in detail, and you yourself covered in detail, is threats against election workers, threats against people who are in politics, threats against journalists. I mean, we, you even see the way that certain officials kind of brush physically aside people like you who are trying to ask questions. Leading up to this election, we saw how part of the Stop the Steal and election deny and denier movement was predicated on a threat of violence and the actualization of that violence, say on January 6th. How did that play out in what you saw? Well, if people thought that January 6th was the end of this, I think we were all uh, very sorely mistaken. We covered some of the election violence through different lenses in the Breaking the Vote series. We had a conversation with lawmakers in D.C., three female lawmakers of color, Congresswoman Jayapal, Congresswoman um, Ilhan Omar, and Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who all have had a very interesting and different perspective of what it is like to be a lawmaker in America in this day and age. I'll focus on uh, Congresswoman Jayapal because she was the subject of a pretty horrifying experience that happened over the summer where somebody showed up at her home with a gun. And I think that that kind of behavior has become pretty normalized. Did you think that this would be part of your job when you were elected as a member of Congress? Well, I've had death threats before as an activist, um, and so I have had to go through that, but I've never had somebody show up at my tour with a gun, um, and I think that was a completely new experience of having your personal space violated in that way. And I would also say that the messages that we've been getting since coming into Congress that have only gotten worse and worse and worse are filled with a kind of vitriolic anger and rage and sexism and racism that, no, I didn't think we would have to go through this um, over and over again. We see, first of all, just guns in general in a lot of political advertising um, also, just the rhetoric that a lot of political candidates and also lawmakers use to describe their opponents, to describe their fellow members of Congress, having them discuss um, the range of threats and also the historical nature of some of this. Barbara Lee has been in Congress much longer than the other two women, and she was talking about how she got threats when she voted against the Iraq war many years ago at this point. So I think that it is always been a part of the American political conversation. We have really reached a sort of terrifying point right now. So on January 6th, uh, I was on the floor and I wore my tennis shoes that day because I knew as a black person, something was going to go too. down. I wasn't sure what, but it's just my antennas were up. And so being a black woman in America, you're always uh, vigilant. You're always waiting and watching, and you always know because racism and white supremacy is in the DNA of America. And until we deal with this, uh, we're going to have this kind of uh, horrific, hostile atmosphere for people of color in this country. And that is uh, what happened, I think, after January 6th. Now others, the white supremacists, think they can come forward, which they have, 
and uh, try to, quote, take back their country. And, and that's their uh, whole mantra. I mean, I think January 6th just surfaced this for, unfortunately, for the entire public, and especially for people of color and marginalized people in the United States. And it's a very scary moment. And I have to say that when we went to Arizona as well, we continued to cover that because it was such a prominent uh, part of the story there. When we arrived at the Maricopa County Election Headquarters, there was a fortified um, perimeter set up around that entire building because of what had happened in 2020. A bunch of protesters showed up there. Nothing got out of hand back then, but the sheriff who we interviewed ahead of uh, the midterm said, we don't want things to escalate. We monitor what's happening online. We want to keep this tabulation center where all the all the um, you know, post-election and, and honestly pre-election work was happening. This place has to be safe because it was basically their version of the Capitol where a constitutional process was taking place. And he felt that it was absolutely critical that they use every resource possible to protect it. No sort of going into the actual voting itself, um, the issues at play that voters were faced with were pretty like massive as far as personal stakes for people, like inflation. Abortion. Abortion, which yeah. is huge. And I think one of the conversations that I remember hearing is that like, hey, should Democrats be talking about anti-democratic forces as an issue that people want to vote on? Like, it's too abstract, it's too, uh, heady, I suppose, when, when you're thinking about something like inflation or abortion, things that are very day to day. What we saw, I think, was maybe the opposite, or, or you know, we saw people engage with that. And I wonder, Todd, like that conversation, as you have reported about it, what, what Democrats should do when it comes to messaging about anti-democratic forces in the, in, in the country, and what role that plays in motivating voters to get out. Because I mean, I think that it is a, it's not a horse race conversation, it's a values conversation and a messaging conversation and like what do people actually care about? That's what elections are about. And so like, what did you learn and who did you talk to? Yeah, there was this massive debate among Democrats leading up to the election about, and it's not new. I mean, the kitchen table debate among Democrats is endless. Um, but it really, really happened here. We should be talking only about inflation and the price of gas. No, yes, no, we should be talking about that, but also people's values are at stake. Their freedom is at stake. Abortion and voting integrity elections are sort of the same thing. It's about, uh, it's about a right-wing minority taking away your rights. We should talk about that more. No, that's too abstract, just like you just said. I sat down with Eric Holder for the Breaking the Vote show, former attorney general from the Obama years, and I sort of asked him this question because he's, he's right into the democracy question. He has an organization, he talks about gerrymandering, he goes on TV a lot and sort of, uh, he's ex-attorney general so he can get more fired up than he did when he was uh, chief prosecutor. And I, and I asked him about this, you know, are, do Democrats have the right message? Does anybody care over there? Our democracy is under attack. I'm not being hyperbolic, I'm not being alarmist. Um, but the reality is that we have election deniers running for governor, um, running for secretaries of state, uh, running for at local uh, levels. Uh, too much uh, of one party is um, turning its back on democracy and is embracing really authoritarian ideas. Are pro-democratic forces up to the battle right now? I think pro-democratic forces are up to the battle, and I think that uh, you see increasing numbers of people uh, moving to the pro-democracy side as they understand um, what is at stake and what the impact of this battle has on their lives on, on a day-to-day -day basis. People need to be held accountable. That's one of the aims of the criminal law. But another important part of the criminal law is to deter people from engaging in similar conduct. And so if we want 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, to try to ensure the peaceful transfer of power, people who acted inappropriately uh, around January the 6th, before it and after it, uh, have to be held accountable. We don't know yet. We don't have enough data to know. You can't really divide voters like X voted on inflation, sure. Y voted on democracy. Politics works like a general set of ideas, a, a, a vibe, okay? <laughs> and it's clear, one thing we do know is that democracy was a big part of the vibe for a lot of voters in ways that a lot of people said it never could be. Yeah. They were wrong. Joe Biden did kind of get dragged to the democracy thing, did one speech in Philadelphia lit all red, kind of like the Death Star, then did a second one right before the election. A lot of Democrats in the wings, why is the White House doing this? They're not talking about inflation or gas prices. The White House knew, knew something. 
that other people didn't. Turns out they were onto something important for young voters and for a lot of voters in those swing states where the offices that control elections were at stake. I think they knew what to say and when to say it. Turns out they were right. And that vibe was the right vibe. Turns out Holder was right about this and people, people responded. They really cared about it. Well, let's talk about the young voters because I think like the Gen Z vote, it's a midterm. Like young voters aren't supposed to turn out, but maybe that didn't happen. And I think when you put these pieces together, like no one wants to see another January 6th happen. We, there's been enough time to yeah. sort of like excavate the causes and yeah. you know motivations and execution of what happened on January 6th. And there's a generation of kids growing up who now can vote who saw like the Supreme Court have three new members and then change precedent. Like you know, 51% of Americans have fewer rights now. So I think like I was really surprised by this election because younger people came out and voted. And that's like not supposed to happen, especially during the midterms. Like how did you guys have been covering politics for a while? So like what did that feel like? What did you see? Same. I was surprised too. We spent election day in Arizona around Maricopa County. We started in the morning in Anthem, which was a really Republican area. They that was part of where they had problems with those tabulation machines. We wanted to see and hear about that. We spent the afternoon on Arizona State University's campus in Tempe, sort of right outside of Phoenix, talking with students. We showed up, huge line, I don't know, probably between 50 to 70 people in line. All kids who I had to ask, are you 18? Like, you look so <laughs> young right now. And kids who, who said, this is my first time voting. This is the first election I've ever felt like I had a voice in. Are you excited to vote today? Yeah, I, 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 this is my first time voting. I, I just turned 18. Um, it feels like I can do something in Arizona. What's the biggest issue that you're thinking of when you go into the ballot box in a few minutes? Obviously, climate change is huge. The protection of democracy is quite important at this particular point in time. What's the top issue that you voted on? As we can see, we are out here today, and there are long lines. That is democracy, and we need to fight for that. Yeah. Not to be alarmist, but like a lot of people say our democracy is on the line, but it actually is. So uh, mm -hmm. honestly, yeah, as alarmist as it sounds, it's true. Um, you know, voting and democracy are like rooted in our core, and right now it's like on a lifeline. Every single person we spoke with was voting for Democrats. I think we spoke with probably seven voters in line that day. Um, they cared about things like climate change. Um, the, the young women we spoke with cared about issues of abortion. Young men we spoke with cared about issues of abortion and their girlfriends having access to reproductive health care if they needed. Um, issues of democracy. I was so surprised, pleasantly so, when I spoke with uh, these three young kids who were all talking about all the candidates um, on the ballot there, including the Secretary of State candidate, Mark Fincham, who was an election denier there, and talking about him and his platform and knowing specifics of what they were going into the ballot box uh, imminently to vote on. Yes, Gen Z showed up, the kids are all right, they cast their ballots, and they made a huge difference in this election. So let's look forward, because like, we're at the point where we now kind of know the broad scope of results. The Democrats kept the Senate. Republicans have the House. We've got Donald Trump saying he's going to run for president in 2024. Unfortunately, there are no breaks in campaigns anymore. What are you guys paying attention to going forward? Have you been able to take a breather, first of all? <laughs> uh, and like, yeah, where, what do you guys feel like? Just based off of the conversations I had on the Hill this week with Democrats, I asked a few Democratic senators, um, did democracy survive? And the immediate answer was yes, but I'm worried about 2024. And one of the things that I heard from several senators, including uh, Chris Coons from Delaware, who is very close with President Biden, was until we have elections where everybody concedes and everybody recognizes that they lost the election, he has concerns about future election deniers, ways to subvert the democratic process. That, I think, will continue to be a focus of our coverage. I think it will continue to be a focus of um, Democrats and some Republicans um, legislating on Capitol Hill. Well, thank you guys for all of your reporting and all of your thinking during this cycle and, I guess, next one, too. Thanks, Krishna. Thanks, Krishna, yeah.
I'm Michael Learmonth, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts, not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.